Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of vodcasts. And this is going to be an abdominal pain in the ER. We did a recent series with GU pathology, and now I'm going to look at GI pathology. We're going to cover a few topics that we commonly see in the ER setting. We're not going to cover everything because if we did, this would maybe be a 30 or 40 part series. Anyway, a couple things to comment on, particularly when we speak about GI pathology, where protocols become so critical, particularly with oral, but also IV contrast material. I have made the point previously that the COVID era has increased our challenges, limited staffing, modifying protocols, particularly with oral contrast when everyone wore a mask, and then we were coming out of COVID, and then we were running out of IV contrast. And just general fatigue and lack of CME activities have all been somewhat challenging. When you look at the GI tract, and truthfully, when you look at any part of CT, why are things missed? Now, sometimes things are too small. Sometimes you make assumptions that may be incorrect. But often it's poor protocols, whether it's the lack of oral contrast or the lack of IV contrast, the wrong phase of acquisition are all common problems. We speak also about the importance of MPR and 3D imaging to help us with diagnosis. But at the end of the day, so much relates to the protocols with oral and IV contrast material. I always like to quote a few articles, one by Alec Megabo talking about oral contrast in the ER setting, the importance of not cutting corners, which leads to incorrect diagnosis, but the importance of maintaining excellence, or this article by Perry Pickard in the same time frame, again, talking about the importance of oral contrast, positive oral contrast, that is, and not to make decisions based on non-medical uh, justification such as pushing patients through faster or this recent article very important by Haram Shash who is a surgeon and published this in JAMA Surgery making the point that if you did unenhanced CT in the acute abdomen it was approximately 30% less accurate okay 30% less accurate that article alone basically says everything about what you need to do. So I'll just re-emphasize, pull that few lines out. But if your ER is giving you a hard time, if anyone is giving you a hard time, if your administrators or anybody else who knows little, just make this point that you're going to decrease the accuracy by 30%. Okay, well, in the ER setting, we like oral contrast. Water works very well. If you're looking for fistula perforation, positive contrast like Omni 350 is better. If you're doing CT enterography, perhaps, then Breeza is ideal. IV contrast, either Visi or Omnipake, around 100 to 120 cc's. We like an injection rate of 4 to 5 cc's a second. Depending on the situation, we'll do single phase or dual phase imaging. We do not do non-contrast scans. Non-contrast scans are good for the kidneys, for stone disease, or evaluating a mass. And we rarely, if ever, do delayed phase imaging. So really, it's arterial and venous, depending what we're doing. If we're looking just simply rule out abdominal pain with no specific pathology, venous at about 70 seconds works well. If you're thinking about anything vascular, arterial phase is mandatory, and then typically you're doing arterial and venous. So things like GI bleed, which we're not going to discuss, things like potential ischemia, things like potential tumors, all of those things are going to get you dual phase acquisition. We'll use thin sections, 0.75 millimeters, reconstructed at 5 millimeter intervals. And as we've discussed before, the importance of going beyond the axial imaging, always routinely looking at multiplanar, both coronal and sagittal, and then 3D imaging, which can be very valuable. In this talk, I'm not really going to focus on 3D imaging. I will focus a bit more on the multiplanar and on the axial imaging. We'll focus on small bowel disease. 
Small bowel thickening, wall thickening typically is over three millimeters, which basically means to me, if you can measure it, it's thickened. We look for enhancement. Increased or decreased enhancement becomes critical. Decreased often with ischemia, though hyperemia can be seen in a range of findings from ischemia to infection uh, to inflammatory changes. We look for positioning of bowel. Is there obstruction present? Is there a hernia? Is there malrotation? And then other findings like the mesenteric fat become very helpful in pointing to areas of abnormality. Small bowel loops typically are considered dilated when they're above 2.5 centimeters. We look at a feces sign where you see air bubbles and intestinal content proximal to the site of obstruction. Sometimes you can see a feces sign in a patient which has poor transit due to malabsorption. Most of the time when we talk about a feces sign, we're talking about something, and I'll show you examples, where we can look for transitions. We talk about wall thickening, and we look at dilated loops of bowel, and where do we see the change in the dilated loop? Can we follow it down? Is it a mass? Is it a hernia? Is it adhesion or any other possibility? Now, small bowel obstruction is one of the critical things we look at routinely. Uh, that's where that small bowel feces sign, which occurs in up to a third of patients, can be seen. But it's not always going to be seen. It's helpful, but not perfect. Here's a nice example of dilated bowel shown very nicely on the coronal view. And you can see the fluid of the small bowel. And then this loop with model density, that's the feces sign. You track it to right here. That's the transition point. We'll see it a little bit better on these other images. And there's no mass there. There's no hernia there. This was an adhesion from prior appendicitis. Very nicely shown. This patient went to surgery. So you have all the key findings. Dilated bowel, mesenteric vessels of patent, transition point, and the cause of the transition. Now, we also see many patients in the ER setting with Crohn's disease or suspected Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a very classic uh, disease process in terms of CT. We've published a lot about it, particularly way back when. We look for mucosal hyperenhancement, wall thickening over three millimeters, mural stratification, seeing three bowel layers. We look for the prominent vasorecta, which gives us the comb sign, and commonly you see mesenteric fat stranding. Here's a nice example with positive oral contrast, thickened dilated loops of bowel, fibrofatty proliferation of the mesentery, Here's that cross-sectional appearance. That's not specific for Crohn's. It can be seen in ischemia or other changes or other possibilities. But again, very nicely shown here as well. Crohn's disease, more common in the distal ileum, though it can be proximal, can be long segments of bowel, can be multiple areas of bowel. And you can see very nicely in this case, uh, the extent of the patient's process the extent of the patient's inflammatory changes, very nicely shown in this example. And here it is again, again, very, very nicely shown. Another patient with Crohn's disease, mucosal thickening, kind of that, again, look at the loops, you see the three layers in the bowel. When you look carefully, you can see the length of the involvement. You can see the mucosal enhancement. You can see the prominent vasorecta sign very nicely shown. You can see it again here on the volume rendered views. So all of the findings, prominent vasorecta, long segment thickening, submucosal edema, prominent mesenteric fat, very nicely Crohn's disease. Another example, really accentuating the fiber fatty proliferation and mass effect. We then see the thickened bowel loop. Again, you can go through a differential of thickening from tumor to infection to ischemia, but the fibro fatty proliferation, the multiple other areas, you can see some bowel over here, the hyperemia, and then the prominent vasorecta. As I go backwards, you can see the vasorecta nicely. In this example, the prominent vasorecta is very clearly seen. Now, 
Prominence of vasa recta can be seen in a number of things, but it's very common in Crohn's. And then the fibro fatty proliferation of the mesentery, particularly impressive in Crohn's disease, nicely targeted here. And here's another example, the fibro fatty proliferation, which with the prominent vasa recta, the so-called comb sign. Again, the vessels are all patent, but look at that branching of the distal ileal vessels, very nicely shown in this example. And here it is with the cinematic rendering. So we've made the point before that cinematic rendering really accentuates those vessels and the mapping of the vessels. Here's another example with a comb sign and Crohn's disease. You see it's terminal ileum, it's wall thickening, it's hyperemia, prominent vas erecta, fibro fatty proliferation, all of the various findings that allow you to be very specific for Crohn's disease. Now one comment, and I'll show you an example in a moment, with Crohn's disease, you have thickening. It's usually symmetric like this. The question always is, could this be a neoplasm? Crohn's patients have an increased incidence of carcinoma and even lymphoma. If you see bulky changes, then it's easy, but sometimes it can be more challenging. The cases I've just shown you have all been terminal ileum. Look at this case, dilated bowel and a stricture right here and another stricture right there. That's all in duodenum. This is Crohn's disease. Now, again, we like to think about Crohn's as ileum and very distal ileum, their ileocecal valve, but it can be proximal. It can even be in the stomach. But this was a beautiful example. Again, you considered malignancy, you considered a stricture, inflammatory disease, but there's no real soft tissue thickening in the sense there's no mass, but just a really impressive example of Crohn's disease, very nicely shown there. And here's another patient with Crohn's, known Crohn's disease, markedly dilated bowel. We track it downward, and you can see the transition is in the terminal ileum. This patient needs surgery, right? That's the transition. Interestingly, remember I mentioned before about cancer, the surgeon looked at the bowel, and at surgery looked like just the typical inflammatory changes of Crohn's. At pathology, there was areas of adenocarcinoma present, and the patient had to be treated for that. So again, it's a little bit challenging. Obviously, adenocarcinoma in a Crohn's patient, particularly when they're young, is very rare, but something at least to think about, particularly if there's changes in the extent of thickening or it's very, very prominent. Now, other things in acute abdomen, I we think about Crohn's, we think about a range of things, ischemia. But here's a great thing that often is overlooked. There's an inflammatory process involving the mesentery, but also the bowel. There's multiple look like little air bubbles. Could this be perforation? But the more you look at it, you realize the bowel has multiple diverticuli present. And this is a wonderful example of jejunal diverticulitis. Yes, we look at the abdomen all the time for diverticular disease and diverticulitis, but we're thinking about the sigmoid colon in most cases and surely large bowel, but small bowel involvement very nicely shown in this example of jejunal diverticulitis. And then of course, diverticulitis is rare, uh, but that appearance is very suggestive. The little tiny air bubbles, the inflammatory mass in the root of the mesentery, something to think about. Now, diverticulitis can occur in jejunum. It can also occur in the ileum. This article by uh, Fintelman way back when, jejunal diverticulitis can be recognized on the basis of the characteristic CT features of this condition. Now, I have to admit, I agree with that, but I see more cases of diverticulitis of a small bowel in conference than I do in practice. And here's an example of inflammatory changes, right lower quadrant. You're thinking about appendicitis. You're thinking about all sorts of things, Crohn's disease, ischemia, perhaps other inflammatory diseases. But you look and there's multiple little diverticuli present. And then you realize this process is small bowel. You think about what could this be? And this was ileal diverticulitis. So again, uncommon. It's not the first thing you think about, 
But you surely would look at this and say there's an inflammatory process in the right lower quadrant. It looks like it's predominantly affecting the patient's small bowel. It's fairly extensive. Again, you think about appendicitis, think about in the right patient tiflitis, you think about ischemia, but this was a case of ileal diverticulitis. Okay, what else? What about ischemic bowel disease? Now, ischemic bowel disease is something we look for many times. We don't always find it, but it's one of the common things you think about in older patients with acute abdomen. We look for luminal dilatation. We look for bowel wall thickening. We look for dilated mesenteric veins, edema in the bowel wall, intramural gas, and mesenteric and portal venous gas. So some of the key things you have to think about is it's a spectrum from early disease to late disease. When you have late disease, then you're looking for air in the bowel as well as portal venous air. Now, it's not necessarily fatal to have portal venous air or air in the bowel wall, but it does mean you have ischemia and likely infarction, and it does have high morbidity and mortality. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's take a break right here, come back, and we'll pick up the study. And we'll do part two. See you then. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CT Is Us YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctsus.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.